I'm gonna send him to his dad's house, um, who he's never met nice. before. Mm -hmm. And if his dad won't take him, I'm just gonna put him in foster care. Peter Multabazi, thank you so much for meeting me today. I'm so excited to talk to you because you, your whole content is about, you know, the foster care system because you are a foster care dad. You've even adopted, how many of your foster kids have you adopted? Uh, three. Three. Wow. I would love to hear just how this all started because it, I, I want to hear how you got into the foster care system. I want to know, like, what made you want to do this? And then I want to know how you've been kind of using that platform to educate people in the foster care system. Because I feel like most of America just genuinely doesn't understand how it works. Like, what are some normalcies that go on that are both really good and really bad and how the adoption process works? Like, so many people just don't have this information. So I'm going to give the floor to you and I'm going to stop rambling. <laughs> All right. Well, well thank you, uh, Rebecca. It's, uh, I've been watching you, so it's really nice that fun. I get so to really sweet. join you and get to share about my journey. Well, for me, it started with me, you know. Uh -huh. So I come from Uganda. I was born in a small village. And as a kid, life was difficult in every shape yeah. form you could imagine. You know, I never had a meal uh, every other day, you know, I had to fetch water three miles away. You know, there was no hope for me. Like no one ever told me that there was hope. You know, when, when your mother can't feed you for a night, how do they say, hey, you're going to be a teacher one day? Well, but you're going to bed hungry. Yeah. And then at the age of four, I began to realize not, not only were we poor, but my dad was so abusive towards me and towards my mom. So for me, I had poverty on one side and then my own father who was abusive. So. Abusive was so bad at the age of 10, I thought, look, my, my, my dad might kill me, so why should I stay here, yeah. you know? So I ran away, I had never been 20 miles away from my village, and I went 500 kilometers away and became a street kid. Wow. Yes. Oh my gosh. So at 10 years old, I was a street kid until when I was 15 years old, when I was trying to steal from someone, and that person, Think about it, like you're stealing from someone. Yeah. And then they see you and they're like, hey, by the way, what's your name? And you're like, wait, you want to know my name? Why? You know, and here's what scared me is because of abuse, for everyone who was kind, it followed with abuse. So him saying it's hello and what's your yeah. name, I was like, oh, trap, trap, run. You know? Right. But he gave me food, but he left. He came back the next time, he gave me food, and he fed me for one year and a half. And one day he said, hey, Peter, if you had an up to go to school, would you love to go to school? I'm like, why would I go to school? I live in the sewer. I'm called a garbage boy. I have never taken a shower. I smell, I stink. I'm a thief. Why would I go to school? You know? Uh, but he said, if you go to school, there'll be lunch, dinner, and breakfast. I was like, what time yep. do I go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when do I show up? Exactly. Oh my God. You're speaking my language, you know? So he helped me. So I went to high school. I went to university in Uganda. And then I w went to university in England. And that's how I came to the United States. So for me, it began with me, you know? Yeah, and that then, trauma. That's exactly. And when I came to the United States, I think I struggled seeing wealth, you know? My first day in Los Angeles, they served me food, but I ate everything they gave me. But my friends didn't eat. They threw it away. So I, I was like, how can other people have so much and others have so little that they will lose their lives? You know, yeah. so I began to question this whole love thing and, and faith. Like, you know, if they say God loves us so we should all have the same things, you know. And then I got to really know about post care. But I didn't know they would allow me to be a foster dad. You know, I had traveled all over the world. I had never seen a black family or a black man who was adapting. So I knew there was no way. So for me, I walked into foster care, I said, I want to do something, but can I mentor teenagers, you know? Aww. Because I thought, at least one hour, you know? Yeah. Can't you hang out with a teenager for, for an hour? Yeah, I mean, I used to hang out for them, with them all day. When I, 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 when I was a teacher, I taught high schoolers. Right. So I hung out with them a lot. <laughs> so for me, I thought, wow, they can give me one hour. So I went in and the social worker said, hey, have you ever thought of being a foster dad? I was like, I think about that every day, but I'm not qualified. She's like, why? I'm like, single. She's like, no, single people can't be false friends, and that's really when I became uh, a false dad. So I've had 36 kids wow. in the last seven years, wow. and now I just adopted three, which has been wonderful, you know? That's it's so funny. Absolutely, it's not an easy road, but it's been the best decision I ever made in my, entire life, in my life. And for me, I think I struggled with, you know, too much is given, much is required. Like, I have been given so much, as I told you my story. Like, how can I live a life for myself 
without really helping those in need because I know it better, you know? I know how it feels to be unloved and wanted. And I wanted to really help kids who were uh, in a place that I was when I was little. That's amazing. And that's, I feel like so many people suffer from such serious traumas when they're younger. You know, some people take that trauma and they want to do something with it. How can I make sure other people don't experience this? Right. Some people are just so strong-willed that they're able to take that awful experience and turn it into something positive for other people. But some people just, some people in the world are not as strong-willed and right. it really consumes them and it really can, like if they don't get the help that they need or the guidance that they need, it can absolutely derail their entire life. Like somebody once sent me a story um, about how they were a foster kid and they were treated horribly and terribly and you know eventually they ended up becoming a um, counselor for kids in foster care but in the meantime they got a part-time job at their local jail and as a foster kid in a rural town most of the foster kids knew each other mm -hmm. and he was like I just I couldn't believe how many of my old foster brothers and sisters and community members were just in and out because it's just consumed them because there's so, there's so much in foster care that, you know, you have amazing foster parents like you who really just want to be there for kids and want to ha give them a safe place to call home, even if it's temporary. Absolutely, yes. But Understanding trauma as a, as a parent to really help you how to parent the kids with trauma. Yes, yes. But there's unfortunately so many people that just don't care mm -hmm. at all like and I really want to get into that but before we do will you tell us a little bit about like what the process to become a foster parent looked like well so to become a foster parent basically is one you have no criminal records you know <laughs> right. so the right. one everyone said yes uh, then two do you have your own job you know so they want to make sure that you can take care of your of yourself before you can take care of someone else yeah uh, so they want to make sure you're stable financially uh, and you have a job that really requires health insurance and all that you need the other is you have room you know because you can't just you know have yeah. a child without a bedroom yeah you know? for so sure they want to make sure you it, it doesn't have to be your personal home it can be a rental or your personal but it has to have extra bedroom if you want one child if you want two siblings uh, that you have space for them to make sure that they are safe uh, and loved the way you want. And then you have to be licensed for 10 weeks here in North Carolina. It's called MAP, where you go to class and then you're licensed. In other words, you're qualified to be a parent. Uh, and that's really the process on how you become a foster parent. I just love that. It just kind of threw me for a loop, qualified to be a parent, because I feel like regular parents might need that sometimes too. Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel some days I'm like, I need some parenting <laughs> skills right here. Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. And it's it's fascinating because like in theory, it sounds so clean cut and structured and like, yeah, this is so great. Like these are real qualifications that people need. But in reality, so many people slip through the cracks and it's people that just don't care. And it's also people that just don't even realize that what they're doing is wrong. And sometimes it's how you're trained. You know, some people are trained just, hey, here's how you follow and be there for kids. Well, for me, I was trained. Here's the trauma that really affects children. And here's how you can help them overcome the trauma. So sometimes it's how we came into false care. Yes, you're right. I hear 40% of kids in foster care are abused by foster parents. So you can imagine that you've, you've come from the worst place and then you think you're in a safe place and then you're abused in a safe place that everyone thought, you know, you'd be. So uh, there's some education where some parents need a little bit more parenting, especially about that trauma kids have endured. The number of stories that I've gotten from kids, like, and I have so many thoughts in my brain, so I'm having trouble, like, picking which one, one I want to yes. go with right now. But, like, I, I've just gotten so many stories from kids on, oh, I've been in the foster care system, and my foster parents would separate food of, here, my biological kids eat first, and here, you can have the leftovers. Or, you can do the chores of the house and my biological kids. Or, you have to share a room with all the foster siblings and the biological kids. And it's just such a split. And, like, on one hand, yeah, when you are fostering a kid, you know, the whole goal, correct me if I'm wrong, is supposed to be reunification correct. with their parents. Mm -hmm. So, like, no, you don't want to claim, oh, I'm your mom now. Right. Right? But at the same time, 
in what world does it feel okay to separate so much to where like you have a Cinderella moment, Correct. you know? And, and for the kids, they cannot separate the two. Wherever they are, they feel they belong there. So yes. when you put those, those boundaries, even highlights for them like, hey, you're not fit to be here, you know? I, Growing up, the one thing I struggled the most was not feeling enough or not feeling I fit there, you know? As a street kid, I moved from one end every night to be safe. When they moved me to the dormitory, I, I always felt like, I don't belong here. So think about, it. you're already feeling that way. And you come to a home where they're like, oh, you know, that fridge you can't touch, that, it, you know, it, it creates even more harm to the children, for, well, for sure. And on the opposite side, um someone sent me a story about how they were like it was it was a white kid was sent to live with a black foster family and he loved this family like he that was his mama mm. and he called her mama and he felt like he fit in and he loved them and they loved him and then one time he came from from school and he saw his mama sitting at the table with his social worker and she just had tears in her eyes because she was working towards adoption right. and the social worker looked at him and said hey um i decided i'm gonna move you to a different family and he said why well you know i just feel like as a white kid you really should be with a white family and i just don't feel like you really fit in here so don't worry i'm doing you this favor Correct. and the kid was just like i don't he was like i don't remember how old he was maybe like 14 maybe maybe younger i can't remember i really can't remember um but he was just like why why would you do that like i'm in a loving home with a woman who wants me to become her son yes and like what kind of messed up mentality of oh well i found some very distant relatives that i think that you might be happier with why they're perfectly fine. Absolutely. But even to shock you, it's happening right now. We both live in Oh, Oscar, oh right? absolutely. You know, like yeah. You know, I'm they, not doubting that at all. I mean, literally, like, it, it's happened to me twice, too, as well, that I had kids who really loved to, to be with me. But because I didn't look like them, they said, hey, we're going to find a better life for them. And, and guess what? They have been in 12 homes since they left. Oh, my god. Think, think about, like... You know. that's that's like the same kinds of people that are like oh they're a gay family maybe we shouldn't let them become foster parents like like that why would you ever i just talked about this with Haley and kendra not that long ago why would you ever want to deny a child a uh -huh. safe loving home just because you're like just because of your prejudices like that just I'm, oh I'm, my god absolutely and we're in 2023 you know think about you know wild absolutely <laughs> Some, sometimes crazy. i want to ask like hey for people who are interracial marriage, should we first, before they get married, should they learn about <laughs> the other one's culture, you know? The kids, they will learn, like we live in a community where there's both of us, and our kids will learn, you know? Uh, yes, like example, I have five white kids, you know? Uh, well, uh, am I not qualified to truly be the best friends I can be for them? Yes. Will I let them really know the culture they're in? Absolutely, you know? Uh, I live in the United States where it's so multicultural, uh, that for our kid, they're just looking for a dad. They're looking for a mom. Right. They're not looking for a mom who's that Right, taller. it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Like, they, the first and foremost, they need to be loved. Like, they need to be in a safe, secure environment where they are not worried for their own safety, not worried about when their next meal is going to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And then can come their identity. But, like... Who cares about identity when you're not safe, when you're starving? Like you, I mean, not, of course, not that who cares, but like, you know what I mean? Right. First who and you, foremost. Who's thinking about culture right. when you're being sexually abused? Exactly. You know? Who's thinking about culture Safety when you're being bothered? Exactly. Like, so you take a kid, and, and for me, that really bothers me so much that to see that you intervene and, and break the, the, the permanence of a child just because the mom and dad don't look like the child, you know? And these kids will literally, 99.9 .9 of our kids, averages spend in 12 homes. Think That's about crazy. 12 homes. That's so crazy. Well, on a, because I, I do want to definitely get into the really like dark parts of the foster care system. Cause like, again, people need to know. I have a lot of story for that. But I do have like little bits of brighter stories here and there just to kind of, you know, like, see the light at the end of the tunnel and since we're on this topic i'm going to share this one now um this this white woman and uh, adopted a couple children from 
China、mm-hmm. and was just very determined that she would make sure that they knew their culture, understood their culture, wanted to take them to China every so many years so that they could feel like they could connect with their roots.、Um, and she was really committed, you know, like she learned Mandarin, like it was beautiful. Um, but her kids were not interested in learning at all. Like, we're just, just not. And so it would always、um, make them laugh whenever she would take them to China so that they could feel connected to their roots. People would just come up to the kids and speak to them in Mandarin. And then the mom, <laughs> the mom would we'll respond, like, the white mom would, like, would reply, and they're like, wait a minute. Because the kids just could not be bothered. <laughs> About what they said. <laughs> But his mom just, she tried her darndest. And I mean, that's all you can really do,、Absolutely. you know? But it's just, it's sweet seeing people take that extra mile, even if the kids aren't interested. You know, sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. I had another person send me a story how they are Native American and their multiple brothers and sisters were adopted by a white family. And, you know, there were some culture clashes and things that their foster parents just didn't understand. But、right. at the end of the day, He was like, my, my foster parents really tried to learn and tried to understand. And he's like, you know, so I stayed with them. Now, my brothers and sisters, they wanted to go back to the reservation, and that's fine. But, you know, I think that the point is like, when, when the effort is there,、um, it's, that's when it's in the, in the kid's court. Like, as、Interest. long as you're taking that first step、Absolutely. and you're making that first initial attempt and saying, like, I see you, I think you're. Val- I think you and your culture and your background is valued. Like, I want to give you the space and the opportunity to be able to express that.、Right. It's up to the kids whether they want to actually learn Mandarin or they want to go and explore their identity on their own. And like, that, it's, it's both,、yeah. yes. You know, like for me, I am an African, you know? Yeah. But I'll take my kids, I'll take my American kids. To see where I come from, but I should not expect them somehow to know every intro. Right, to dad, yeah, you know? yeah. I、yeah. really expose them to where I come from. This way, but also it starts from home. We eat African food, you know. There's some things that I get to do, they're like, This is from my dad, you know, and they have embraced it the way they know, like food. They love to eat kids. So if we can make it African, absolutely. And soon we'll go to Africa so they can really experience that. I and, love and, that. And I, and I think for me, those are the two, the way to blend two cultures by honoring where they come from, but also by introducing them where I come from, that they get to see why dad does these things this way.、Yeah. Or what does he like this type of food? Or、uh, these spices,、uh, that they're able to truly feel and know that, like, this is my dad's culture. And I want to embrace it, but not deny them where they come Absolutely. from. Absolutely. So, kind of going. I'm trying to, I, this one, I'm always like, I'm ve- I've been very cautious about this episode about like picking the right words because、right. not, only, not only is it such a sensitive topic, but there's also so much misinformation and so much people just don't understand about the foster care system. Like, I want to make sure that my words are. Precise, and then I'm saying what I mean because, like, with my ADHD brain, sometimes I'll say something <laughs> and it's not the right words,、Absolutely. and I'm like, but people know what I mean. But, like, with this, there's just so much confusion around. I like, I can't, I can't, I feel like I can't allow that to happen from my voice,、wow. you know what I mean? Um, especially because as a teacher, like, I had my own encounters with. Um, foster care and things like that, and kids being abused by the system. And I know the impact. I mean, obviously, don't know as much as you do, but I know that I know a little bit about the impact that this stuff can have on kids. And I think it's really important that people understand that. So, like, based on your foster kids, because you obviously have really great relationships with them, right? What are some of the experiences that they have had that, are, that people just don't understand are very common? Unfortunate, awful occurrences within the foster care system? I mean, oh gosh, the list is, is this yeah, long. Yeah, I know, know, I know. I'm like getting ready to start crying. Absolutely. And for you, Rebecca, as a, as a teacher, so for me as a single parent, I have my co other parent that、right. teaches because my kids spend, spend more time with teachers than anyone else. So I feel like they're my co parents in some way. Oh, I'm already <laughs> tearing up. Oh my gosh. I'm telling you. <laughs> But oh boy, so we've seen so m- like for me who have had you know over 35 kids, you, you see the worst trauma you could think of. Think about like we live in the United States, but there are kids who don't know if there'll be a next meal, you know?、Uh-huh. I've got kids who hoard a food and hide it, you know, because they're not sure if food will be, will be there tomorrow, you know? And for me to really come alongside and say, how do I teach this kid to know? There'll be food there without accusing them that they're stealing and without making it a big deal. You know, those are the things that I've seen. The other 
you know, some kids have been sexually abused, you know. I've had, I would give you an example. I've had a kid who came, he, for the first night, he went, he went to the bathroom and he was supposed to take a shower and he picks up what he, his poop basically and just smeared it all in my, my bathroom. And all I could smell was just so bad. So I walk in, I'm like, what's going on, you know? And I realized that, oh, he's protecting himself. In my eyes was like, my house, how much I'm, you know, how much is going to cost me to clean that up? But I had to take a step back and say, hey, why did this kid do so? You know, come to find out he was protecting himself. That being dirty, that I would not touch him in some way. And I mean, I, I sat there and I cried. I said, boy, <laughs> you okay? You okay? You know? And I said, I promise I will never do this to you. And I'm sorry that it happened to you. You know, so to know that our kids will do things that don't seem normal, but to realize that when you understand why they're doing so, it's really helpful to love on them and help them really overcome that, you know? I've had kids who think if they give you sexual favors, they will get a meal, you know? Oh. Think about, like, you, you got a seven-year-old come to you and say, you know, basically, they want to earn the food you're about to give them. Kids here in the United States. That's disgusting. You know, that, that kids go through and, and somehow we always think, oh, the, their parents neglected them. No, the it's, trauma mm -hmm. they've endured is so much for a four-year-old, for a seven-year-old to endure that any 30-year-old has never endured uh, as, as a kid is... is Someone, um, just kind of going off of what you just said is, and it's so, it's not funny. I was about to say, it's funny, it's not funny, but it's... Every single example you just gave me, I received so many stories validating of exact same situations, exact same experiences. Like one family sent me a story of how they um, went and adopted one of their foster kids or two of their foster kids. It was a sister who was around 10 and her little brother who was about six. And the very first family meal they, she's 10, she's not very sneaky. So, you know, they saw her put her napkin in her lap and about half of her plate, she just slowly would pick up from the table and put under, the, put under, into her lap in the napkin and just kind of, she thought she was hiding it. Bless her heart. And they just asked her, they're like, hey honey, um, why are you storing your food in your lap like that? And she immediately got very upset and very embarrassed. She's like, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And they're like, no, 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 it, it's okay. It's, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna start crying. No, I'm, I'm they're, crying, yes. They're like, it's all right. We just, we just wanna know why you're doing that. Right. And she said, well, I just wanna make sure that if you don't give us dinner tomorrow, that I can still feed me and my little brother. Oh, yeah. And immediately they, they took her and they're like, okay, we need you to understand something. And they took her and they opened the fridge and showed her the entire fridge full of food. And they took her to the pantry and they showed her the entire pantry full of food. I need you to understand that this is yours. And if you are ever hungry, you can come get food whenever you want. Like, you don't need to hide food. You can eat it right now. I want you to go to bed with a big full belly. And then if you wake up in a few hours after you go to bed and you want a midnight snack, you can come get it. Like, we just want you to know that like you have access to food whenever you need it and we are never going, going. Yeah. Well, the I, fact that there are 10 year olds who are so convinced oh yes i'm sorry Rebecca, i've had a i've had a, a five-year-old that you know that he will so he came so every time i fed him he would go sit to the dogs where the dogs were so i said but why why do you have to sit over there but he said that's why i always sit you know so i realized that you know, oh. that he, basically, wherever he was coming from, the only way he could be fed was if he fed with the dogs. Oh my and, God. And I have, look, look, I have a feeling too that I think he was eating dog food, you know. Oh my gosh. But, I just, I don't understand. And I know there's going to be people who are listening who are like, well, why are these people foster parents? Because of the check. They get, they get money for that. And there are, I've received so many stories from kids who, we're reminded by foster parents constantly, well, you're only under my roof until I, as long as I get a check for you. Right, and absolutely. It's disgusting. And, and yeah. Oh, I've had a, you know, one teenager where, you know, so our pantry is open, you know, they can go in wherever they want, but he won't go there. He would just sit there. You say, are you sure? You know, are you sure? I said, yeah, you, you can go and get what you want. 
And he said, no one has ever allowed me to get food that way. You know, it was portioned at a specific time. The fridge was locked, you know, the pantry had a lock. So he didn't know that you can get food. Just walk in as you want. All food on, you know, in a basket. No. And to realize that you're 17, you're 17, but you've never been given an opportunity to have the meal the way you want it. You know, you know, I've had kids where, you know, you ask them, hey, can you do this for me? And they stare at you like, and you're like, why, what? Are you listening? It's like, well, you're not yelling or calling me name, so I don't know if you're serious, you know? And you sit there and say, man, how could someone destroy a child? <laughs> innocence. Uh, but they have to be yelled at and called every name just for them to be able to respond, like, why? Someone sent me this absolute vile story. How, you know, they, they were a foster family. Um, and they knew of another family who, they were a young couple and their neighbors, the young couple, they thought it would be super trendy to adopt some foster or adopt some kids. I can't remember. No, they adopted some orphans from Liberia and didn't even like take a second to realize like these kids were in the middle of the war in Liberia. Their parents were killed right in front of them. Like they weren't just orphans. They were traumatized orphans right and they this young couple just thought it'd be super trendy to adopt these kids from africa and very quickly realized they couldn't afford all the help that these kids really needed yeah, yeah. so the foster they asked their neighbors they're like hey we know you guys foster do you mind just like keeping them until we can get on our feet and get situated and the foster family was like oh of course, like anyone who needs help is welcome. Or that's that's why we do this. Um, it took a week for the 14-year-old boy to tell the foster family, I don't want to go back because they touch me. Mm. And when the foster family tried to call out, like, hey, what is going on? Like, these were some accusations and this is really serious. I don't know how this all works. But I guess the young couple um, used their parental rights to force back the 14-year-old and send him back to Africa so that he couldn't testify, he like couldn't any, anything like that, so that if the police were called, there were no witnesses, nothing. He's in Africa. So the foster family spent the next year tracking him down to bring him back home, and they just went ahead and adopted him. Yes. I mean, you know, you know, my, you know I have a 17-year-old, you know, he was left at the hospital. When I got a phone call, they said, hey, uh, there's a kid that needs a home. And I'm like, you know, kid, how old? 11. I'm like, no, I'm not taking yeah, 11 year olds. And then they said, well, but he's at the hospital. So I said, oh, OK, I can help at least for the weekend, you know. So he comes in and, and I come to find that, you know, he was adopted at the age of four, you know. And the family that adopted him, I drove him to the hospital and they never said goodbye. They never gave him the reason why they didn't want him anymore, you know? So, oh. so I looked at him, I said, you know, I'll be your dad. Oh. So he's my first adopted kid because he was left at the hospital. I think about like you, you give a child a stable home for nine years. And one day you wake up and say, I don't uh, want you I'm anymore. I'm tired. I, I, sorry. <laughs> oh my uh, gosh. And, I mean, think about, think about the trauma. Think about the the, the things he had to do in his life. One, he wasn't wanted by his by the parents, and then they, you know, he thinks he's safe. He's adopted by a family, and the same family says, "Sorry, we don't want you." Uh, and that's really for me has been really hard to understand. You know, why why would you? So for for him, after adoption, I asked him, "What are two things you like to do?" He said, "I would like to go visit my elementary school and go see my former parents." So I'm kind of like. Uh. <laughs> Why would we go? Remember, because he could not understand. He didn't get it. You know, why would they? It's not like he did something wrong and they said, you get a go. No, they went, took him for checkup and they never came back. Literally, they went to the county and signed off their parents' rights. Is it that easy to do? Yes. See, is it easy for anyone to do? Like, that easy for anyone, foster parent, adoptive parent, regular, biological parent? It's that easy. That easy. Oh, that makes, that makes the story I was going to tell even worse. Um, 
I, when I was a teacher, oh wow, this one always makes me so upset. So, um, when I was a teacher, um, one of the stories that will never leave me, and I still sometimes check up on this kid, um, I had a kid who, there was clearly a lot going on at home. Mom kept trying to call parent conferences, talking about him trying to harm himself. He would pull me over to the side and say, none of this is true. Mm -hmm. She's just looking for attention. Now, there's multiple sides to every story. Correct. But at some point, sides don't matter. Some things are just wrong. So one day this kid, um, I'll call him Connor because that's my character name in my skits. That's always my go-to name. Connor came up to me and said, I'm, I'm getting really scared at home. I, I don't know what to do. And I said, okay, what's going on? And he claimed that his mother placed her prescription pills in his backpack that day um, because he was getting ready for school, moved his backpack, heard a sound. He's like, what? what is that? He heard pills sloshing around in the bottle. He's like, what is that? Found his mom's prescription pills in his bag. I guess later in the day, his mom called the school saying, my kid stole my prescription pills with plans on selling, so bring the police and check his stuff. And he just so happened to find them earlier and took them out, so there was nothing to find. Um, and it was, it was a, very, a very tricky situation of, I, and I, I went to the counselors every day about this, like, what do I do? What can I do? And they're, they're, there's, like, there's nothing we can do right now because it's just a giant he said, she said kind of mess. Well, then I started getting emails from the mom. Um, Thanksgiving break was coming up and she was saying some vile things about how she just doesn't know if she can put up with him anymore and ha ha LOL. Like she would put ha ha's and LOL's in her emails about he doesn't know it, but over Thanksgiving break, I'm gonna send him to his dad's house. Um, who he's never met Mets. before. Mm -hmm. And if his dad won't take him, I'm just gonna put him in foster care, but this is really the last week that he'll be at this house. And he doesn't know it. And just so you know, this is confidential. And if you tell him or try to warn him, I will sue you and I will come for your job and I will get you fired. And so I'm just sitting there this whole last week before Thanksgiving break, so worried for this child legally unable to do or say to anything. anything and I didn't I didn't know what to do and so and I, I asked the admin and they're like you can't do anything and I'm like well that sucks and um the day before Thanksgiving break I just went up to him and I said hey I know you've been working on getting some of your grades up um and I just want to make sure that you have my email address in case you have questions or need any help over break while you're doing some of your makeup work and he's like yeah it's on the website and I'm like no Connor I need you to write down my email address so that if you have questions you can Don't let me. me know because this dad's house was like across the country wow. like I I never saw him again after this day um but I did get an email from him two weeks later saying hey Miss Rogers I now understand that you what you were saying to say yes. and I'm so glad that you were worried about me and I just want you to know that I'm safe and I'm gonna stay with my dad for a while um and I never saw him again yes. and sometimes I will sleuth on the internet <laughs> and check on oh, I found his Instagram I'll check every now and then <laughs> I know it's, it's but it was just so gross to me that this parent was laughing and like using the foster care system as a threat of I've known we'll take yeah. him all just like I'm done with him. Like yes. someone in foster care. Re Rebecca, That's this week, this week I was watching something on the news. The mom was letting, the mom was sending her daughter who's 11 to men so she can get drugs. Oh my gosh. 11 year old, you know, to, um, it, it's not last month, it's this week. And you sit there and say, you know, this little girl, how will she overcome? The, the person who should protect you. And I think for me, that's why maybe fostering has been really wonderful for me because my father was my abuser. You know, I never had one kind word, like no one kind word I'd ever hear from my dad. Uh, you know, I was known as 
you know, never amount to anything. You know, <sighs> you're nobody. I wish you were never born so I did not have to feed you. That's what I had when I woke up. And that's what I had when I went to bed. So think from the age of four, five, seven, why would you want to be anything when the person who should protect you is the one that truly makes you feel worthless in a way, you know? So for me, running away wasn't like I was looking for a better place. I really wanted to die, but die in the hands of someone else, not my father. And that's really what happens to our kids. Sometimes they've, they've endured so much that they, there's not, nothing left, you know? And by the time they come to us, it's a little too late, you know? Or sometimes that, uh, that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Uh, and that's the difficulty of, of our kids in false care, you know, that we get them when it's too late. Uh, but for me, I believe if I if I overcame my troubles, you know, that I believe I can change one child at a time, that I can use the little of what helped me to overcome my trauma to truly help the kids that I uh, I have in my home and that I have uh, adopted as well. But it's a uh, ruthless, yeah. you know bad place and but also there's a, there's a positive side too that our, we're not saying every every parent is bad we're not saying right you know, it, it's well yeah, it's, it's it's there's a theme in my series that like you know whether we're looking at teachers or and i always use teachers and nurses as my go-to because like i was a teacher and my mom was a nurse <laughs> but like for the most part like the general consensus is people go into this because they want to do good good but when it comes to foster care, the police officer episode that we had, there's so much harm in these systems that it's it's not just a few bad apples. It's no. not it, it's becoming such a harmful stereotype that you I can't even I can't even put it into words. What? You know, it's just so, <laughs> so daunting so. and overwhelming and it feels so helpless because I'm Again, these are, in theory and on paper, these are sections of the world that are supposed to be there strictly to help. And so many evil people have just turned policing, mm -hmm. foster care, like these kinds of things into nightmares for so many people. And so my question for you, at least when it comes to the foster care system, in your opinion, how do we fix it? <laughs> how do we fix it? That's a hard one. Make you know? people not suck. <laughs> exactly. But I think how we can, for me, this is how I feel. There's some things will never, will never stop a child, you know, sexual abuser, and and they, until they stop themselves, you know, we always get to know when it's too late. But there are some we can protect, you know. There's sometimes where you and I have friends and families that when we do something, they'll be there for us. But there are some families, moms who are single, struggling there by themselves and there's no help. And sometimes when you don't have that safety net, when things go wrong, they'll go right to the bottom, you know? Then maybe we can reach out, give an opportunity to those who are struggling to not judge them, but give them an opportunity to have a place to come and say, hey, I'm struggling, can you help me? Before they lose their kids, you know? Yeah, we absolutely. always say, I wanna stand up when it's too late. But to really, you know, as especially moms, I don't know why I feel like they, they, they get the worst and they judge the worst, but men sometimes are not judged that way. So the best way we can is to truly intervene when mommy is struggling by by not judging them or by, by yeah. calling them the most horrible. And then hopefully then they're avoiding gonna hide. and yeah. avoiding the foster, avoid care, foster care. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can intervene before the foster care comes in, I think that would be the best way that we can, you know, truly provide our ways, small ways. You know, a mom's struggling, you know, Absolutely. can we provide daycare, you know? A mom's struggling, can we do babysitting for her so she can take care of what she needs to? What are things can we help that one mom? They need to go rehab, you know? How can we really come alongside them while they're in rehab so they can come back and have their kids and stay in the lives of their, you know, of their children? I know every mom of every child I've had, and I'm still in touch with them because I realize that they are my ally, and the best way I can is to truly be the resource for them. You know, uh, like this weekend, I'm going to have two of my former kids. Why are they coming? Mom needs a break to make sure that That's I can wonderful. give her that opportunity to say, I know it's hard. I will help bring your kid rather than worry that someone is going to report her uh, in, you know, in force care. So that's, I think, what can really help when we come alongside those who are struggling. And give them a resource. I have kids who have come to me because mom was living in a car. Was she a bad mom? Absolutely no. Did she like a place to stay? Yes. So the kids were taken away 
because they were in danger. That's right. But what she needed wasn't the kid to be taken away. What she needed was to Help. provide a place exactly. to sleep for. And she stays with her kids, you know. Let me ask you, when you have an issue, when your kids go, what do you do? Do you stop drugs and stop smoking or stop alcohol? What do you do? When you're really stressed, you do, do more. more. You know, it's so when, when kids are taken away, what is left for the mom to do? You know, drink herself to death because she lost the one thing she loved. So sometimes taking the kids away really goes. Makes it worse. Yes. Rather than how can we help you while you still have a kid so you don't lose your kids. Uh, I think that that can stop. That's so beautiful because it really just embodies the idea in the goal of reunification. Yes. And I feel like that's another issue within the foster care system of you know you, we talked about people who don't care about the kids and don't want the kids and that's its own issue on one side yes one side there's the but other. then you have the other side of the spectrum where it's like okay i'm your mom now well no the goal of foster care is reunification, reunification. Yeah. and are there situations where it is in the better interest of the child to yes. go through an adoption process yes, yes. But there's no reason, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this after it, but there's no reason to go into foster care with the idea of, I'm going to take to these kids exactly. from their parents. Yes, I know I'm going to get a bad hit as well, but foster care isn't an adoption agency. No, no it's, it's it, it is a place where kids are put, so they are taken care of while mom and dad are trying to figure that out. And I think that's the... The, we fall in love with these kids. We love them, you know. They love us. They to tell us, I want, oh, can you be my mom? I get that. But at some point, I have to know there's a mom who has done everything they can that they ought to go back. And that's sometimes where uh, the wrong comes in. Well, I'm doing a fair, but I'm the one doing one, two, three, four. Why can't I keep the child, you know? And I think for me saying, no, from the get-go, you sign to help and be there for the safety of the child so they can go back home. So why did that change? Well, yes, we always fall in love, but that doesn't mean we have to take the child away. And I think that's where sometimes we force the parents get it wrong, you know, that we get born with our kids and we don't want to let them go. And we become the villain between us and the bio parents. And I want to say, and I'm, I'm truly, you know, not, not unless the kids are absolutely specifically for adoption. I think kids we force that have mom and dad are trying to do whatever they can do. We should truly have an open hand to say, yes, if you're ready, you can have your kids, you know, yeah. uh, back. Uh, that's the best gift we can give to the kids yeah. that need mom and dad. Absolutely. And I think there's there's some people on social media who like, I think that, you know, they mean well. And I don't watch a lot of these people, but I've had some of my friends, some on social media, some not, who are working in the foster care system or are foster parents or are going through adoption processes who like talk about some people that they see on social media who are like glorifying this idea of, okay, I'm fostering and now I'm mom now. And now I'm making, and now I'm in these mom groups. And now I'm, and it's like, you're not mom. And if you want, if your goal is to adopt a child, that's amazing. There are so many kids out there who need homes, who are looking to be adopted, who would love that. But that's not the foster care system. No. The foster care system is, first and foremost, supposed to keep kids safe while their parents hopefully can get themselves together and in a place where they can provide a safe and loving environment for their child. I'm sorry. Like, I, I disagree with the town forced to adapt. Like, I don't think yeah. that. I think that is a wrong way. You know, you're there to force it, but the adoption is not part of the deal. Right. You know? it's, a, it's, a it's a once in a lifetime, oh, yes, this is an opportunity, and I so, may or may not embark on it. Yeah, I've posted 38 kids. And you've adopted three. Three. But my the one I adopted first was my number 11, you know. Mm -hmm. and the, the two one that, that I, was abandoned. Exactly. Yes. And the two that I've just adopted, they were my number 24th and 25th. So wow. you can see how long it took because the whole goal is so they can go back home, you know? Absolutely. And, and yes, there, there are some families who want to adapt. So from the get-go, make it clear, I want to adapt. So let's start from there, you know? Because there are kids in the fourth care who are absolutely available for adoption. Exactly. So let's start from, exactly. I'm going to adapt. Mm -hmm. But when you say, I'm going to adapt, I'm going to force that in the hopes to adapt, 
I think that's, that's going to get you in trouble. Yes. You know? Yes. And the it's boundaries. just so fair to everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. So what kind of made you decide, okay, I'm going to adopt these kids from my foster care? I mean, obviously, number 11, we know, we know was, yes. was abandoned. A... You're his dad now. Yes. 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 So my two came for, they said, hey, we need them. For, can you have them for the summertime? So for me, I said, summer, three months? Sure, I can do that. Well, <laughs> summer camp, you know, uh, mom and dad went ready. So then I put them in school. You know, uh, eight months later, you know, there were no phone calls, there were no visitation. Wow. And then in two years, no phone call, no visitation. In that, I, I knew that they would go to kinship. Kinship meaning, if mom and dad can't have them, then we're gonna look at uncles and aunties. Well, we tried that, that didn't come, until they said, hey, they've run out of all options, and if you're open to adopt them, you can. You can, I was like, sure, absolutely, I would like to. But my first goal was they go back home or they go to kinship, whoever uncle or aunt needed them that I will support so they can go. But those that also uh, didn't come to fruition, so I knew I was uh, set to, to adopt them. Um, and it's been wonderful for sure, you know, uh, that I had them for three years and finally they get to stay for me, with me for the rest of my life. And that's how my goal. I wanna force and help the kids to go back home. But if they cannot, I wanna be the fine role parent for them. I, I don't want them to move from one end to the other, no matter how old they are. I want to be their final home so they stay uh, as long as they want. That is so sweet. Oh my gosh, that's just so beautiful. Are there any other misconceptions about the foster care system that people just either don't know about or are just blatantly incorrect about or anything like that? Yes, men can foster, you can, <laughs> you can be single and foster. And I think for me, for men, whoever is listening, I think we haven't been held account accountable. We've been told that's mom's job. But I think to 2023, it's everyone's job. Mm -hmm. It's mom and dad and we can all really take care of our kids. You know, the other is most people don't want to foster because they're afraid of being attached to children. They're like, I, I can't let them go. But actually, you are the right parent. Yeah. Because our kids have real they attachment kind of issue. Love. So they need that kind of love. That person who will, you know, fight for them, but also show them the affection that you love them. You know, so the one thing you think will deter you, actually, is the one thing uh, that we need. I promise I'm not a robot. I get attached <laughs> to my kids, you know, but at the same time, you, you, you get to learn to love love on them and, and let them go. The other part, most people accuse me, they say, I have, my, all my kids are white. They're like, you know, do you just take white kids? Like, no. You, you, they say that to you? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. They think I go to the room like, you know, you are, you know, just know, I, no child comes in false care for good reason. Right. None. Oh, you know? yeah. And for me, I take emergency kids, meaning they're the hospital, they're the police, or you know, they just lost mom and dad and they need a safe place for them to be. I usually, if I have room, I'll take them. So I want people to know that there's no formula on how you there's get a no child. There's no rhyme or reason. Right? You just get a child on your Absolutely. Doorstep. You know, for me, I know the boundaries I cannot do. I have teenager boys, so I will not take a teenager girl. That I know, you know. Absolutely. Or I'm a single dad, so I can't have someone who's medically need more help because that means I would have to... You know, right. You, you're to, only one person. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are some where I say, this I can do, this I cannot do. You know, so those boundaries are there. But how they come to us, really. It's just random. It's just random, you know. Uh, but we cannot, we can all be false friends. The other part is some people think when we don't have a good relationship with their bio parents. We do. You know, most of us. You should. Parents. Yes. Yes. No matter how, we really try to make sure for the sake of the child, that we pursue their friendship with their parents so we can help them navigate on how to have them back, but also when they go back home on really, you know, passing on the knowledge that we help their kids as well. But it's the best way to also support the family when you stay in touch uh, with the parents. So yes, anyone can be, I anyone can that. be. I love that. It's like my heart is like so, fun. It's, it's a good like heartfelt ending when there was so much like yucky in the middle. You know what I mean? Like I. I feel like I have mascara all over my face from when I was crying. You made me earlier. cry. You made me cry. Oh, I was like trying so hard not to sob, especially at the one. But the one story always gets me every time. But thank you so much for sitting and talking with me about this. Like this is so informative, and I think this is also so important and something that like is happening right in front of 
society's eyes every day and they just don't have the information to know or understand and the only way to really the only way for it to change is for people to just know and want it to change absolutely change. like when people's eyes are on the system the system will will help will do a little bit absolutely better. you know you know most what are the the most kids that don't get adopted or don't get a uh, good placement are siblings and teenagers because yeah. you know when you have four kids you know you can't take them all and they get to separate them and that causes a lot of trouble so people to know that hey you know there are siblings in the system who we want them to stay together but it's impossible to you know then there's me who has two and then when another one comes they're like hey there's a baby and you're like ah. <laughs> you know the other thing i would like to tell our viewers okay i'm ready no one would ever tell you there's no how do i say it there's no formula of how I can say, you're going to have a kid for three months, no. Or you're going to have a four-year-old, no. You know, usually it's, I want to have between four and seven, but you get a toddler, but you, that's not who you ask for. So coming in knowing like, hey, I'm going to open my boundaries to yes. not stick to one. Like my, this is what I want. Like there's not a formula for like what kid is going to need a safe place. Oh like, yes. How kids old? just need a safe place. Yeah. How old, when, what time? No, you, you, you never know. It, it's, there's no formula. It'll just, it, it'll just be random. And How long are they going to stay? No formula. No idea. <laughs> It could be two years and you don't hear from anybody. Oh, yes. Oh, it could be they came for the weekend. I mean, that's how my first, my adopted son came. He was, I just said, for two weekends. A week, yeah. No, I said one weekend. Well, he's my forever child, you know? So that's there's so no sweet. formula of they can tell you. Literally, it's like being on a roller coaster, running, going up and down, and you have no end to it. That is false care. Wow. The good news is that you are at least a shining beacon of light in the dark, dreary world of foster care. And I can only hope that there, I mean, I know there are other parents out there like you, but I just really need there to be more. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I tried, need there to be more I, of them. I try to keep it positive because there's so much negative, you know, that I wanted to generate with people and show like, here's how I do it. I want you to hear my kids talk. I want to see what we do every day so you can say, oh, there are no more kids. Yes, there are no that. more kids. You know, but two, I wanted to show men, you know, men out there like, hey. You can do this too. You, you can do this. And I found out that I, I've had 38 kids. None of them has said, I wish we had a mom. You know why? Because they, they just want a parent. Dad. They want they a just, parent. They just want a parent. Exactly. But they never had a dad too. So to say men, that's how kids are looking Some for. people, especially younger boys, sometimes yes. they need that dad. Yeah, role model. Mm -hmm. That's so important. And they're not looking for Jordan shoes. No, they're only looking when it's tough at school to say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to be. Just like you as a teacher, that that's how you, you, you stood up for the kids. It's going to be okay. Not knowing what would happen, but to say... It's gonna be okay. Maybe I just I just give myself an idea. Maybe what we'll do because I feel like there's still so much that people can learn about the foster care system. Maybe we can have people like in the comments put questions about both the foster care system and the adoption process, and then maybe we can do another one like in a few months and yes. just answer all the questions because like, we don't know what people don't know. Absolutely, we only know what we don't know. Absolutely. Kind of that and doesn't make sense. And you and I know so much that. We can give it, you exactly. give us questions and then we answer yeah, our questions. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so let us know in the comments. And in the meantime, thank you so much, Peter, for hanging out with us and giving us all of this information, this so, super valuable and important information. And thank you guys. I don't know where the camera is. <laughs> Which one is it? Thank you My guys bet. so much for hanging out with us and hope to see you all next week. Bye, my lovelies. Bye. Bye.